afternoon. I thank you for uh, coming to the USF Friday seminar on the transportation research. So my name is Yu Zhen, I'm a professor from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, also leading the uh, NISA National Institute for uh, Congestion Reduction, a national UTC, and also leading the research program on advanced air mobility. So this seminar is sponsored by the department as well as Center uh, Carter, um, Center for Urban Transition Research and facilitated by the IT student chapter. So today, actually, we have an internal expert with us, um, Ms. Mr. Jason Jenkman, and he's a senior research associate working at Cutter, and um, he leads a team on various safety projects. So um, he has worked on this for over 20 years and managed the community and the transition safety programs focused on advocacy, education, health, and outreach. And Jason's expertise is in school transportation, local and statewide bicycle and pedestrian safety, vision zero slash safe system approach, as well as other transition related initiatives. So when you come to this room, you probably pass by the stairs where you see um, a poster there, which is a bicycle club. And Jason actually has served as a faculty advisor for the Bicycle Club at USF since 2009. So besides holding a master's degree in public administration from the USF, Jason actually is a league cycling instructor with the League of American Bicyclists. And he's serving on the executive board with uh, Bike Florida. It's a nonprofit organization. And also he's executive member with the TRB, Transition Research Board's Bicycle Research Subcommittee. And he's also the statewide trainer slash educator for Florida's Safe Routes to School program. So today, of course, he will talk about active transition, which the area that he's very enthusiastic about. So Jason, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. Thank you all for being here. We got a big crowd today. Excited to get into this. Uh, Move, connect, thrive, the power of act active transportation. All right, I'm just gonna go over the agenda a bit, you know, about the presenter, about myself, um, the health background, we're gonna discuss that, why we're talking about active transportation. Um, safety and policies associated with active transportation and, and other programs. School transportation, sharing in transit and infrastructure. So there's a lot to go over. I love this photo too. This is a photo of Riverwalk downtown Tampa. Before that, we didn't have this many people walking like this, you know, and it's so nice to see an investment of infrastructure in the city where people will have a place to go, a place to walk, a place to exercise and just be social. So. There's a lot of benefits to uh, infrastructure that promote active transportation. A little bit about myself besides the introduction. I appreciate the introduction and appreciate you all being here again. 35 plus years of bicycle safety education. Sounds ridiculous, right? But this is me in a bike safety public service announcement uh, video when I was about nine or so, sometime in the 80s. And, and so that's why it's 35 years of uh, education promotion that I've done. I, it's kind of a joke. It's, it's only about 15 years, but, uh, I did work for Hillsborough County where I, I promoted a lot of programs to the community, um, activities. We did a lot of bike safety programs back then when I worked for the County, worked with the Florida safe routes to school program since 2008. Um, I'm a league cycling instructor as well with the league of American bicyclists and the opportunity to promote biking. I will do. Uh, and get someone on a bike. I worked with a student recently and uh, at USF and she said, I've never been on a bike before. And I'm like, well, we need to start that today because it's a great option for uh, commuting and exercise. Uh, and I also worked on a few programs around the state um, for our different programs at Cutter. I love this quote. I was lo looking up some research on, on active transportation and despite active transportation and everything we've done, whether infrastructure, education, uh, there still is a, uh, a rising rate of, of obesity in this country. So there's a lot more to active transportation and, and health. Um, it's it's a, a life-changing effort in our communities. 
So we want to not only promote active transportation, but other healthy initiatives, which I'll talk to talk about as well later on. Um, and actually, this is a, a picture from Washington, D.C. at one of the museums, and I had to take a picture of it. What is your favorite way to get around? Legs, unicycle, bike, teleportation, cab, and Air Force One. These are all kids, kids putting these, these comments up there, and it's, it's great to hear from kids, too, on what they're thinking um, at the time. Okay, the WHO. Again, we're getting into uh, the World Health Organization, not the ban. In 2022, 2.5 billion adults age 18 years and older were overweight, and 890 million adults who were living with obesity. Living with obesity. So we have a, a really important effort to get out to our communities to not only eat healthy, but also travel healthy, commute healthy, and think about the way they live their lives in their community. Do they work far away from home where they have to drive? What about living closer to work? you know, where they don't have to drive. So we have to rethink the way we live our lives. And that's part of this whole thing we're working on is improving our local communities. In Florida, only 36% of adults are at a healthy weight. That's very scary. And I have a map to show this as well later on. Um, by 2030, almost 60% of Floridians will be obese or overweight. So we have an uphill battle right now, and we're doing the best we can in our communities in Florida to combat this battle. So we, we have a, a long way to go. It's a long road ahead of us, but we have to invest in our infrastructure for healthy communities. This is from the CDC, uh, a map, and they've had this map over the years. Um, I think it go dates back 20 years ago. And you can go on the website and see the changes in the color of the scheme of things. And basically, Florida is not in a good place for um, where we are with obesity rates. Uh, we're about 30% to 30, under 35%. So it used to be yellow and green and a few reds. So it's, it's very scary to see the prevalence of the obesity rate skyrocketing over the years. So it's not just Florida. It's all over the country. I would attribute this not only to the lack of connectivity and transportation, but also maybe our eating habits too and, and our healthy and well-being. I like to, I, I love this. This is from uh, Transport in Scotland. This is a, uh, I, I look at this like the food chain. You know, growing up, we looked at the food chain of what to eat, what not to eat, and what was healthy, what not healthy, what's not healthy. And this is the food chain of transportation. You know, understanding transportation priorities, this is where we have to think when we're thinking about transportation. It's not so much the cars anymore. You know, growing up, it's like, oh, when I turn 16, I'm going to get a car and, you know, got to drive places. And that's that's great. But it doesn't help you in the long run. It doesn't help with your future. It doesn't help with your progression as you're growing as an adult. So we got to think of active transportation. How do we want to live our lives in the long run? Wheel, walking, biking. I love how Scotland uses wheeling. I don't usually use wheeling. I say rolling or cycling, but I like the wheeling sound of uh, that that term. And it goes down to cycling. You know, cycling is a, a really great form of transportation. Uh, the infrastructure is improving to encourage all road users to to think about not only walking but also cycling, um, with, based on the infrastructure. And then you have public transit. So we go from walking biking to transit. These are great active forms of transportation. You got to walk to the transit station. You got to, you can bike to the transit station. And then it gets to the more of the sharing opportunities, the car sharing, uh, the car ownership, the car pooling, and finally the single car vehicle ownership. So this is the healthier to the, what you can think of as less the healthier um, options of transportation. So think of it like the food chain. So active transportation, I've already jumped into this a lot, but it is a, any self-propelled human power mode of transportation, obviously walking and biking. Um, but infrastructure can help promote these transportation changes for these vulnerable road users like walkers and bikers. Um, and there's many more details to active transportation besides this. You know, you go into policies and we'll talk about that, some other programs and education. Uh, so that's very important how it, it relates to active transportation. I love how our cities too um, are reinventing themselves. They're, they're 
changing, they're making our cities more connected. They're making our, our cities more vibrant. This is from the city of Tampa. Um, right over here on the right, the left side of the slide is, is a crosswalk where they provided, um, or they implemented a paint to show that they're books, but it's a crosswalk. They obviously got that approved. This was an approved in, um, implementation. And um, it's to promote not only safety, but hey, we're walking, we're, we're a vibrant city. Um, also, we have on the right side of the page, uh, an intersection. Uh, the city of Tampa had a program called Paint Saves Lives. And the idea for that was to not only promote that, hey, there's walkers here, let's paint the intersection, let's paint the crosswalks to show that people are here, they're walking, but also to let drivers know that hey, th there's something going on here. Um, so there's many benefits to programs like the Paint Saves Lives program that City of Tampa did, but it's also reinventing our cities. A lot of people are moving back to the downtowns where there's more, more things to do, more community um, events going on. And you know, you, younger adults can move downtown now and feel in a lot of downtowns in this country and feel like, hey, I'm a part of this community. A lot of them live, grew up in the suburbs too. And you go, I don't want to live in the suburbs. I want to live where a lot of things are going on. So many benefits to living closer to where you work, as I mentioned before, but also um, living that social life. People want to be more social these days. So we're seeing a lot of changes to our cities. Also schools. Um, many schools, especially schools I've worked with over the years, are changing the way that the facade of their schools look. You know, they want to encourage this outdoor activity for students. You know, when they're walking to school, they go, I'm very prideful of my school. Look at this. I mean, it looks like a fun school. This is the outside of one of the schools actually in Tampa. They did a, a, a sidewalk project where they painted the sidewalk and also the side of the building. Um, this school in particular, I would say 90% of the students walk to school. So if you are one of those students walking to school and you have this on the side of your building, your painted sidewalks, more prideful. You're like, this is this is part of my community, um, and we're seeing a lot of communities actually in community schools uh, invest in the exterior of their school to show that this is a welcoming place for the community. This is a place of learning, but an opportunity uh, to promote walking and active transportation in their communities. Uh, I'd say, I gosh, what is this? Um, Ten years ago, maybe. <laughs> Uh, downtown Tampa put on their Cyclovia, or Cyclovia, sorry. Um, in downtown Tampa, they they shut off an entire stretch of Kennedy Boulevard um, in downtown Tampa. That was the the roadway that was uh, shut down for activities, for walking, biking, um, drawing on the, uh, the 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 asphalt, doing bicycle rodeos, doing community things. And I'm gonna talk about this more as we go along, but the what I found the benefit of a Ciclovia, especially in an area like the Tampa Bay area where we're a growing active community and especially with transportation and, and exercise and, and recreation, is that we got so many people out there. And I say we, I was part of a committee. A lot of this was uh, attributed to the city and and the uh, law enforcement and uh, downtown partnerships. So there's a lot of other organizations that were really involved to get this going. But what I found was that doing events like this get people to rethink of where they live and rethink the opportunities of what the possibilities are. That was my takeaway of it all. Because when I showed up and I looked down a couple miles both ways, open place to walk, bike, have fun, I was like, this is a game changer. I mean, I don't think people realize how much of a game changer it was, but it was an opportunity to broadcast um, active transportation, having fun in our communities. Um, and we saw more of this later on, more styles of this. Uh, T City of Temple Terrace, right around Uni University of South Florida, did this as well. Blocked off a stretch of roadway, had a Ciclovia as well, very similar to this. And we have a nice little bike rider over there. Her name is Elliot. So we see, we've seen changes in our communities that promote active transportation. I will get into this more later on in it, but I will mention 
Um, if you are an active commuter as far as biking to work or biking to school, University of South Florida had, had brought, um, with the Center for Urban Transportation Research, if, um, had brought some bike lockers. You know, maybe you're like, I'm not going to bike there. I like my bike and I just need to be more secure. Um, there's several areas. They provided bike lockers at the top left, which are great. They can lock them up. It's almost like your personal locker if you get there first. Uh, bike racks, so important to transportation, especially with biking. Oop. Um, you know, you wouldn't think that would be it would be that important. But now we're seeing e-scooters come around, bikes come around. Now there's a battle between who takes over the spot, you know, who's going to take over this bike rack. Uh, so we may need more, especially in areas where there's policies where you can't bring e-scooters in the building or you can't bring bikes in the building. And they might be pretty expensive, so you need a place for these. Um, so it's important to invest in bike racks to promote active transportation. Um, you have roundabouts. I'll talk about the bike sharrows in the bottom right. Um, you know that with infrastructure changes, especially uh, when you install a new bike lane, sometimes there's no room for a bike lane, or maybe the funding's not there to install a bike lane. And the bike sharrow is a, a good option that may be temporary, might be permanent, but it's a good option to say, hey, bicyclists can ride in the roadway here in this location, or it may be just a temporary fix for the location. So there's many opportunities for infrastructure. Um, active transportation, as I mentioned, connects you to other transportation modes. It can, you know, walking to a transit stop, walking to um, a rail line, um, biking to a rail line, taking a scooter share to a uh, a transit stop. So it is connected to these other modes of transportation. And that's why you got to think about the bigger picture. It's not just, hey, we're telling people to walk and bike. No, it's it goes further beyond that. So sometimes I ask this question to an audience, you know, what does your community need to do to incorporate? What do they need to do to incorporate active transportation in their community? And a lot what a lot I hear is you need some encouragement programs. You know, we didn't know about this. You know, this is happening in this community, but not happening over here. So you got to find the needs and find the gaps, um, especially working with a city or county. And usually it's talking to the citizens um, of what of their needs, um, especially with, with any mode of transportation. Getting into safe routes to school. So this is kind of my wheelhouse. I've been working with safe routes to school programs for a long time now. Um, and I'm currently working with a program uh, to educate communities. And, I, and I, I'm really proud of this program because they've come a long way over the years. Um, walking and biking to school, in 1969, 48% of children, five to 14 years of age, usually walked or biked to school. So that's 48%. Now today, um, fewer than 15% walk and bike to school. I mean, can you guess? How, why that is? Why do you think that is? Anybody want to raise your hand? What is it? Cost, infrastructure, maybe the schools are built on the outskirts of town where there's no connectivity. There's so many reasons why uh, walking and biking has, has reduced. I mean, and also the growth. You got to think of the growth of the community. Um, infrastructure is very costly. So um, I really think safe, a program like Safe Routes to School helps bring more active transportation to our communities. It's just doing doing it strategically uh, for those communities, especially newer families. We didn't know we can walk and bike to school. Sure can. And part of that is talking to schools. Here are your options. Here's what you need to do to promote uh, travel to students. And we've done that over the years, worked with the schools. Tell me it's 2024 without saying it's 2024. Um, we were at a school last week uh, doing a, we did a, a workshop for uh, local leaders in, in transportation in, in, in um, this area, in the Tampa Bay area. And we noticed, uh, we talked to a few of them and they said, you know, we have a lot of students walking and biking to school. And this is a K through eight school, so kindergarten through eighth grade, so very large school. And I asked, like, how do you how do you manage the transportation? You know, how do you manage the pickup or the drop off in the morning and afternoon? And I go, well, it's pretty busy here. Uh, for instance, we have a lot of e-scooters here. That's that's a lot easier. That's not even half the picture. I mean, 
I've worked in safe routes to school and working for schools o over the years, and it was usually bikes. And I'm seeing the e-scooters slowly take over. Slowly, as I mentioned, they're taking over the bike racks. It's an easier form of transportation. And also, students can travel further, a further distance to school now, if their parents allow them. But uh, taking e-scooters has become a lot quicker to get to uh, an option that's a lot quicker to get to school. Um, you have the golf carts. Yes, that is a new thing. Golf carts are a new thing uh, for some schools. And how they do it is they basically carpool through golf carts, the electrical vehicle golf carts, EVs. And um, it becomes like a parade. And this is kind of a school that's built. This school and community was built for walking and biking. Yet they've brought in not only e-scooters, but they brought in golf carts to get around. Now you can say, well, that's not active transportation. Yeah, but they gotta, you know, they don't drop the students off right at the front of school. There's actually a golf cart line, maybe a quarter mile away, where the students have to walk to that golf cart line. So you can say there's that first mile, last mile element to it, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it's just interesting to see that um, parents are opting for this option and. The one thing that I noticed between this is, as you can see in the far left, there's a corral of golf carts that the parents were very social with each other. And I've, I've worked on programs like the walking school bus. It's like kids walking to school in groups. The parents were talking to each other before and after school. They have that social element. They get to plan their weekends together. They're all neighbors. They get to know their neighbors. I mean, how many of you know your neighbors here? Raise your hand. Let's. Okay, two, <laughs> two and a half. Um, yeah, so sometimes you know your neighbors, sometimes you don't. Doing programs like this, like these active transportation programs is a great way to get to know your community, get to know your neighbors and be a part of your community. Exactly, the question was, are, are these subdivisions? It's yes, you have apartments, you have how, you know, homes, they're all big subdivisions but the school's right in the middle, the center of the neighborhood. And that's how schools used to be built until I'd say 80s and 90s when they started making mega schools or schools on the outskirts of the town where you had to take a bus. So we're, we're encouraging counties, cities, school districts to make these type of, be a part of this solution and put the schools in the center of a neighborhood rather than on the outskirts. So it's harder to do with, with the growth of our communities, but um, I know a lot of them are really trying to do this. Real quick with Safe Routes, I, I, I'm really supportive of all of Safe Routes to School. They've done a lot since 1997, especially in Florida, where uh, there was the Safe Routes to School toolkit that was created uh, by the University of Florida. And since then, so much has happened and, and active transportation has grown within our communities, uh, community schools. Uh, but a lot, a lot of work needs to be done. Sometimes it's just repeating to build up. It's not so much recreating the wheel, but repeating over the years because people forget families move out of communities. So you just got to keep going and have some kind of sustainable effort to keep it in our schools, keep it in our communities. Walking one mile to and from school each day is two thirds of the re recommended 60 minutes of physical activity a day. So you walk to school and from school, you can get that recommended um, physical activity, students will. And it's about, it's about a mile they encourage. Usually students who live a mile and under will walk and bike to school, most likely. One out of five children and adolescents are affected by obesity, that's the CDC. So again, we're not only really trying to change our travel behaviors, but we're trying to promote physical activity through this form of active transportation. A real quick story, um, so it isn't just telling you, hey, you need to walk to school. You should walk to school. Sometimes it's the infrastructure and you can't walk to school. Or if you there's no infrastructure, no sidewalks, then you're walking on the grass, and you're in fast cars. And you've seen it all the time. There was a community that we worked with where they were gonna install a sidewalk. And you know, it was planned out, they were ready to go. And the community said, we don't want a sidewalk. Well, they didn't want a sidewalk, but to tell you the truth, they may be in fear, maybe in fear of losing their busing. If we have a sidewalk, we might lose our busing. That was one of the, the conversations that was uh, taking place. 
However, um, some of the parents said, how is this going to help my child? I mean, we literally had these questions of, of maybe it was very negative towards having a sidewalk. They didn't feel like the, it was going to help their community. And so came the build the nine eagles drive sidewalk. It was really, you know, you had parents for and against it. We brought in professionals with the Florida Department of Health to talk about active transportation. This is in 2010 before we had that active transportation thing going. And there are about maybe over 50 people in this room that were just really concerned about the project. And it turns out the project happened and more children walked to school on the sidewalk. We have the evidence. We didn't have the support initially. It was very, um, very kind of sketchy uh, situation because when you don't have support of the citizens, it makes it very difficult to have a implementation in place, uh, infrastructure implementation. But after talking with the citizens more and saying this type of infrastructure will help your community walk to the store, walk to school, promote safety, promote health, healthy activities, it really, the end result was great. Um, fun fact, fun fact, the person who created this Facebook meet thing or whatever it was, um, this back in 2010, um, her dad created it, it was, is now the president of the bike club. Small world, USF bike club. So basically, uh, she told me that. I was like, oh, really? That's, that's crazy. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, I, I'm going to play this clip real quick. Um, I know everybody likes videos these days. Um, this was at a school at Hunter's Green Elementary where a student was biking, part of our bike train program, and he started documenting his bike rides and why he enjoyed his bike rides. You're probably not going to hear the, the audio, but you know, I thought it was just a really unique situation. Actually, you can't hear the audio, but he's created a lot of videos, and this is like 2011 maybe, 2012, uh, before we really saw people blogging their experiences or video blogging their experiences through YouTube. And, um, you know, I think, I think this was important, not only to him, but his school. The principal was involved with this, um, bike to school day. And again, it's little things like this, when you hear it, um, of what, why it's important to him, um, you know, many kids may, may feel the same way. It's the idea of, you know, you have a child in a car looking out the window to school in the car and see a bunch of kids biking by and go, why can't I do that? You know, and that's the little bit of encouragement they need or the parents need to hear to say, well, let's go try it next time. That's why events are important. That's why the cyclovia is important. You know, we need to get outside our box and do something different. And I think it, it it's, it's events like this. It's it's kids taking the opportunity to promote themselves doing um, events like this that help shift that culture slowly and surely. <laughs> um, active transportation at schools again. Again, I have a wealth of information um, about school transportation. I won't get into too much more of this, but you know, safe routes to parks. I did work with a school in South Tampa where um, the school and the park, city parks program got together. So when the school was over, the city parks um, recreation leaders would pick up the students at the back of the school, gate would open, and they'd walk a mile down the road to the park where the kids would be there for a few hours until the parents picked them up. That is somewhat of a shared use agreement, but it's also a good partnership that doesn't happen too often. I used to work for a parks program doing very similar programs like this. School was a mile away, yet the kids had to get bus to the park. So that's what, what really started my interest with Safe Routes to School, was programs like this in communities where they felt like this is what we have to do and this is what we're going to do. The nice thing was I got to audit the walk, see any issues with the stop signs and the sidewalks and provide it back to the city. So it's always good to see how they're walking, but also see the infrastructure and if there's any updates that you can provide your, uh, your partners. Um, encouragement initiatives and mobility programs. Okay, so uh, it's, again, it's, just, it's not just infrastructure. 
It's not just saying, hey, you need to go and, and bike. Sometimes it's programs to promote it to different age groups, to different groups, like safe routes to school. Um, there was uh, a mobility program for older, older pedestrians, Safe Mobility for Life. It's a program uh, throughout, the throughout the state of Florida um, with the Florida Department of Transportation. And the idea of promoting uh, two older, older citizens on their transportation options and staying active. You know, sometimes they have to come out of the car. They get to an age where they don't want to drive anymore. They don't feel comfortable driving anymore. Give them more options with transit, walking, and biking. Um, so there is a program for that in the state of Florida. We've promoted uh, health and safety through the uh, Alert Today Florida program. Um, you know, giving walking safety tips, but also um, pairing them up with health benefits. Um, everybody kind of, you know, understands that health and safety do are tied together. Uh, so we're just reminding them with this information. Back in 2015, I partnered with the Florida De Depart or the Hillsborough Department of Health, part of the Florida Department of Health, on Walkability Day, and this was really a great opportunity to bring out something unique. So Walkability Day was is really neat because we brought all our partners within the group and we assessed um, some of our neighborhoods for their walkability. So we had a checklist, but we also promoted it as a health option. So you're walking, you're auditing as a community, but you're getting your steps in. So it was a really cool program that we did and we did it in several neighborhoods. We had a lot of press about it in the media. Um, so working with the Department of Health on this in Hillsborough was really fun. Um, and they're still doing some great work there to promote um, active transportation and, and all kinds of um, healthy options. Just recently in the past few years, uh, Love to Ride has come out. This is a basically initiative. Um, it's, a, it's an agency where they promote uh, riding bikes as um, an, an option for commuting or recreation but it's a, there's gamification to it. So if your community is, is supported or supporting a love to ride effort, um, it's a gamification where you can log your rides and you can do it through your workplace. Usually it's done through the workplace, but you can do individual or club rides. But the idea was to say, hey, if you're, if you're driving to your work and you have an option to ride, maybe a gamification will help with your agency to get more people out thinking about active transportation. Um, so I think you can win awards. Yeah, um, agencies won awards or individuals won awards for their efforts or their rides. Um, and you can log them based on your city or community. So it was, it was, it was a pretty neat program. It's still going on today in, in different communities. Um, it's global too. And you can post, you know, since everything's social these days, you can post your, your experiences. And I love the fact that it says my doctor is happy, which means my doctor is happy. I'm out in the community. This was actually a very important um, program back when the pandemic happened, because if if you remember uh, when the pandemic happened, they said you had to stay inside. You couldn't go anywhere. But many people said, I actually want to start riding a bike. I want to go out my community. I can't stay, can't stay inside all the time. And they wanted to go get some physical activity. And some of that was doing programs like Love to Ride, getting out and riding. Uh, and it's done through an application. Different applications will collect the data, so check it out. Micromobility and other options. So this is the hot topic. Um, how does that uh, uh, work with active transportation? Well, again, you know, you you can take micromobility to transit, that first mile, last mile, um, the e-scooter sharing. You're still walking to the sharing locations. Um, you know, some of the sharing locations just aren't right in front of where you need to go. So you get some physical activity. You're not just standing on the, on the e-scooter the whole time or the e-bike. Um, you could go to a car sharing. Again, you can get the car out of your life and bring more walking into your life using these different options, multimodal options. And shared micromobility has grown, as, as you can see. Um, obviously, there was a dip back in 2020 for obvious reasons, but back in 2022, 130 million uh, as far as micromobility um, is concerned. That's that's a big jump. And um, I don't I think we're gonna see more personal micromobility vehicles, especially with our youth. If you notice the school transportation when all those micromobility or e-scooters were docked at the school, 
I think we're going to see more individual ownership over time. I'd say the gap there is the repairing of these vehicles and the batteries. So if you don't feel comfortable repairing your e-scooter or e-bike, it might be very costly to, to repair those down the line. I mean, I don't even know where to bring an e-scooter or e-bike if, if it breaks. I mean, it's not really promoted. I think a lot of bike shops are taking that ownership and trying to repair them. It, I'd say that's the gap in the market. I mean, I think, I think that's it. If you're looking to start a business, maybe fixing e-bikes and e-scooters. Um, I mentioned that first mile, last mile, shorter trips and longer walks and reduced vehicle miles traveled with a, a motor vehicle. Um, again, if you're in a car, there's no social activity. When you are out in your community, taking an e-scooter, e-bike, usually those are for social trips. And we um, did a, pro a project, a USF evaluation project for the city of Tampa and city of St. Petersburg, where it was mostly used for recreation. And part of that recreation experience was is social activities and being a part of your community outside the car. So you're walking, you're getting to where you go besides using these um, micromobility programs. Uh, I mentioned this is the program, we did it here at USF. Um, E-scooters could have a negative impact on users' health due to uh, reduced physical activities. You can definitely argue that, and this is based on a survey too, so it's very subjective to the survey. Um, however, I, I do think it does promote physical activity if you do use an e-scooter. That's my personal um, observation because you're using the e-scooter and you're getting places and you're out of the car. Um, there is research that indicates that, again, this kind of complements the, the previous one where um, research indicates that people who previously walked short distances or walked to the nearest public transport stop may now opt for e-scooters. Now, to argue this, this statement, I would say that actually, again, back, getting back to it, if you're using an e-scooter, you're active in the community. I did talk to a few school representatives um, during the workshop, and they said more students are e taking an e-scooter from a longer distance. Um, so that would, in a way, um, take away from those students walking and using physical activity. However, it's getting them to know their communities, getting around their communities. So again, e-scooter isn't the solution. I think, I really think just getting to know your community is the solution for future active transportation. Uh, USF actually had car sharing at one point. We don't have it anymore. But the idea of this car sharing was that you didn't need a car on campus. And again, this is all important to say, hey, you know, if you have a car on campus, you're more, your personal vehicle, you're more likely to use it you're more likely to use your car to go places. If you don't have a car and you use these other mobility options, you're more likely to get more physical activity, get where you're going uh, using these mobility options, but also using uh, walking as another option, as a supplemental option. But I, I've actually loved this, this uh, car sharing program. Uh, you show your card and it was free for students to use. You did have a membership fee, but the students use it for free. Uh, if you were late, you had to pay a fee, though. So, you know, I, I don't think the students like that one. I mentioned the first mile, last mile. This is important. This has a lot to do with the e-scooter, the micromobility efforts, walking and biking. If you are taking transit, um, the first mile, last miles, you take, take that first mile to the transit stop, get to your destination, and go the last mile to your uh, destination when you get there. Uh, so that's part of the reason why I had said that micromobility doesn't really take away from physical activity uh, due to that first mile, last mile effort. Because again, they won't put a scooter share program in front of all, where you need to go all the time. Uh, ride sharing, um, the, again, you, you need to go places. Ride sharing is another option. Um, not necessarily active transportation, but again, you're, you could walk a few more blocks to save a few more dollars. You know. Every every block where you're going, every mile where you're going is an uh, is uh, added to your bill uh, uh, for the car sharing programs that are out there, so or the ride sharing. So again, options for for active transportation are there. They're just not heavily recognized because oh, I just jump in the car and go. Well, technically you can walk a few more blocks and then jump in a car and go. Okay, 
policies and active transportation. These are important. I mentioned infrastructure, education, um, different programs. But how about policies? City of St. Petersburg, I believe this is 2001 or 2002, uh, did the Play and Close to Home initiative, making playgrounds available within half a mile of every child in St. Petersburg. Um, this was a, a, an amazing program, S still there today. You'll see playgrounds everywhere. And this not only showed that, hey, we have to have playgrounds ar around our community to promote um, physical activity, but opportunities for future connectivity with possibly sidewalk installations that aren't there. So it almost was a caveat to say, hey, well, we have parks, let's connect them to our communities through sidewalks. Yeah, we have a question. Sure. So, so the question is, adding a sidewalk to your to your right of way is your home. Will that decrease the value of your property um, by installing a sidewalk? Well, they can't install a sidewalk without your permission. Obviously, it, it, the owner's permission. Uh, in my opinion, it adds value, but you know that's that's very subjective to the local re real estate uh, um, options. But I think it does add value. You know, you have a sidewalk connecting to your community, not necessarily a sidewalk in front of your home, but to your community um, is, is a good option for any community, because especially for this parks program. So we've seen a lot of these uh, shared use agreements really benefit um, our communities, especially in Florida. Another policy, complete street policies. These were policies around the state. I had an opportunity to travel with Smart Growth America around the state of Florida to talk to each district about implementing complete streets efforts. And as you can see here from the, the image to the left, we have a four lane roadway, two lanes each way. And then we have a community where on the right where they installed a, a complete streets policy, basically reducing the lanes, uh, in, increasing the, the bicycle lanes, reducing the driver lanes, putting in a crosswalk, thinking about the pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, so it was a really, good discussion we had around the state. Um, I know each district, FDOT district, cities, counties, um, they were aware of this. We just said, hey, you know, here's some more options for complete streets down the road. And we're seeing more of this in our communities, these changes, and actually these changes are getting better now. Um, they're coming up with better options now. So there's, there's more changes that are happening in our community to encourage pedestrian and bicycle safety and encourage more people to ride their bikes and walk, sorry. Health in all policies. Uh, this was a project that I had an uh, opportunity to work on with the Florida Department of Health. It was a collaborative effort and approach to encourage cities to think about these health policies, how they affect transportation, how they affect the health of their communities, how they affect the infrastructure in their communities, not only for walking and biking and other modes of transportation, but also food and food deserts and changing the idea of um, promoting healthy, healthy initiatives in our community. Um, and they created this wheel. This is actually a wheel that shows, you know, active living here is, is the external part of it going into the healthy community and environment for um, health in all policies. We had a lot of cities and counties participate in, in this program that we had initiated with the Florida Department of Health. And again, sometimes it's just gearing the wheels up and going, hey, did you think about this? Hey, here's some options. And then they take it from there. We're not expecting them to be a part of the health and all policies forever. It's like, let's think of what you can do to improve your communities. And this wheel does remind me of the safe system approach and how they approach safety. So Florida Department of Health approaches health with this wheel and um, if you're involved in any kind of safety transportation initiative, there's also the safe system approach wheel, which is very similar to looking to this. And I think doing approaches like this is not all comprehensive and it's it varies for each community. And that's what I like about this. You kind of pick and choose uh, where to start and where to go from there. Again, this is the safe, safe in all policies, um, not only promoting physical activity, but connecting to safety access to food, access to medical care, environmental quality. Um, when we were working on that pro program, it was, it, was, it was an outstanding program to, to really encourage these cities. And this was in Florida too. So we had an opportunity to work with cities and counties uh, to 
you know, rethink the, again, that word rethink, rethink the way they are uh, working in our communities, setting up communities for their citizens for the future. Infrastructure and active transportation. I mentioned paint saves lives. You can find some really great murals and catch your attention what to look at in your community. This is actually uh, right near Tampa. Um, it doesn't have to be infrastructure only. It can be, but um, it doesn't have to be big roadway changes either. Sometimes it's signage, letting, know, letting drivers know where bike, bikes and peds are. Um, rectangular rapid flash and beacons to help pedestrians cross at cr uh, mid-block crossings. Um, you have crosswalks there, truncated domes right at the um, intersections. Um, the idea is we want to get people walking more for that physical activity, but we want them to feel a little more safe when they're walking on the sidewalk or across in the street. What I love about this photo is um, this is right off the University of South Florida campus. Um, for a long time, they had some bike lanes, didn't have some bike lanes, more of a shoulder. Uh, just recently, a uh, protected bike lane was installed with emphasis, uh, green marking emphasis areas. And that's what I love. I love the fact that now it's installed both ways of traffic. Um, we may see an increase in biking to U University of South Florida campus. I hope so. I hope we'll see that increase. I, I think we will, but it's more, it's more encouraging than a non-protected bike lane. Um, so this is a very good sight to see, and I think, uh, I think we're going to see more protected bike lanes in the future. Um, a recent study came out. I can't remember the publication, but uh, that protected bike lanes is encouraged by the uh, citizens. The citizens want to see more of this, not only locally, but uh, nationwide. Roundabouts, another infrastructure that we don't talk about too much, and people usually, I hate roundabouts. I usually hear that. Um, but they are some of the best infrastructure for peds and bikes and slowing down traffic. I mentioned the safe system approach. Um, that's one of the biggest parts of the safe system approach is speed, reducing speed roundabouts um, can definitely help do that as well. This was in DC um, and I, I pulled up, oh, sorry, I pulled up a picture um, of this because it reminded me of when I was in downtown Tampa a few weeks ago and it was a crowd similar to this, crossing at the crosswalks, but we were able to cross diagonal. I mean, law enforcement was guiding us, but it just made more sense. Um, there were no painted painted crosswalks, but we may be heading that way too. It may get to the point where we don't want to cross left and right. Diagonal might be the easiest location uh, for big groups. So um, it just reminded me of this photo I took a few years back. Truncated domes. Uh, the yellow strips here for uh, pedestrians who are blind. Um, so we're seeing more of this. There's, we need better infrastructure for all road users, all pedestrians, um, and keeping that inventory is important um, and, and making sure that that infrastructure is there uh, for the long term. So a quick reminder for active transportation. I know I went over a lot, but um, remember to boost your mind or your mood. Sharpen your focus, it can help you with that. Uh, active transportation can reduce stress. It's, it's working out, go for a walk, um, go for a bike ride, and it could improve your sleep. If you're really getting a good, good workout, um, your body has to shut down and say, hey, good workout, you need some rest now. So active transportation plays a role in all, all of these, and, um, and I think that's a, one of the biggest benefits is your personal health. Real quick, 150 minutes of moderate workout, walk briskly. You can do some light yard work, picking up leaves, uh, playing with children, biking in a casual place, and muscle lifting weights at least twice a week or so um, can keep that um, energy going too. It's not just um, cardio. Oh. If you really want a good workout, jogging, running, swimming laps, rollerblading, uh, competitive sports if you want to and jump roping but so much you can do with active transportation these are just supplemental to your commute to where you need to go thank you all for having me you all have been amazing great questions and if there are any more questions i am happy to answer them now thank you thanks online too i can't see you all any questions 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, last year, I attended a conference in Chicago, and one of the campaigns they reported was about they try to encourage the people from the transportation mode into the cycling. So what they plan to do is they give away 3,000 free bicycles to the community, to the citizens. Like the citizen do the registration and they may do the selection by the reason. So before the people get the free bicycle, they also, they also get the uh, safety education, like the speed limit, the, the road, the infrastructure that needed to do. So my question is, any efforts like this that our Hillsborough County has been done for the past years or plan to do in the future? As far as an encouragement tool, you're saying um, basically they gave bikes away and education to complement each other to encourage more bike riding. I, I mean, I, I don't disagree with the opportunity to provide a bike to someone. Sometimes giving a bike out for free isn't the answer. So I mean, I don't know that it's sometimes it's the type of bike too. I mean, people have their preferences on, on, on the type of bike they wanna ride. Um, I think it's a nice opportunity to reach out to a community and say, here's an education with a bike to go on. That's very generous to give a bike and probably bike helmets. I don't know of any efforts like that going on locally or around the state of Florida, but I know that um, there are different programs and uh, organizations uh, where, in, especially in Tampa, where they give out bikes if you're a part, if you are not give them out, but maybe at a reduced price where you can um, earn a bike. I know there's an organization in Tampa, just low, nearby USF called Well Built, where you can go in and help fix bikes for the community and earn a bike, maybe a discounted bike too. I think that's a good way of doing it. And, I mean, giving out bikes is fine, but um, also I think it's it's important to maybe earn a bike or, or you know find ways to, uh, the two-way street, work with the community, and earn a bike. Um, I don't know, I'd be interested to see more information about that, but I don't think we have anything like that locally. Thank you, thank you. By the way, I love the photo you shoot in DC because it's the site of Tang Renjie. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Got a question. Hello, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> so uh, you promote, uh, so I think three mode of bicycling or active transportation, like uh, for short distance, for healthing at health activity, and also for last mile and first mile mm -hmm. uh, using active transportation. So when we look at Tampa Bay or in general in Florida, so which one is more important? Which one we should promote more? So what is the view of, I don't know, Hillsborough County, uh, decision maker, which which one is more important? Uh, as uh, more important as which mode? Yeah, Be between biking or no, no, biking in the short distance, biking as a health activity, or bike uh, for first or last mile. Oh, multimodal. Yeah. All of them. No, All of them? <laughs> <laughs> no. I I think um, to, it depends on the distance you're biking. I think you get a more more of a workout. A lot of organizations, um, businesses, larger businesses have implemented like showers in their facilities. So if you were to bike a long distance, they want to encourage more bikers um, to their work. So they offer showers where you you know you don't come into work all sweaty. You could have that option. Um, so there are different um, organizations that do promote that. First mile, last mile. It just depends on on the individual and. and what's going on. I mean, they might live close to a transit stop, so they bike the transit stop. They have an opportunity to put the bike on the transit. And it, again, it's it's very um, optional to the person and what they're living, where they live and how far they have to go. Um, would I encourage all of them? Yes. Uh, can you do all of them? Yeah, probably. You could bike a further distance, you can take transit. But um, I, I think out of all of them, I'd probably choose biking over e-scootering. Um, in my opinion, because e-scootering, in my experience, has been very difficult for longer distances, um, especially if you're, for my my commute's around six miles, and I've tried it, it's not that fun. <laughs> the infrastructure doesn't allow for it, so we might see changes in e um, micromobility, e-scooter infrastructure. Biking is definitely my number one option uh, for commuting longer distances, for sure. So. 
I kind of answered your question. <laughs> and also maybe electricity assisted bikes instead of just a bike. Yes, I yes. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't talk too much about that, but I, I'm glad you brought that up. I know we're running short on time, but someone, um, I'm, I'm part of a Bike Florida organization and they do a lot of recreation rides around the state and group rides and off-road rides. And someone had said, hey, it's not fair that they have assisted um, bikes on this ride. And, and I go, well, I get what you're saying, but you may have an older citizen who may not be out there unless they have that assisted bike. So they're getting out there and getting that physical activity with the assisted e-bike. Um, so I think it is a really great option. Okay, we have quite a lot of questions online besides lots of compliments. Oh. Your presentation. Great presentation, great presentation. Okay, I will not repeat more. Okay. I'll go direct to the question. So um, the first question, do you think community sentiment is shifting towards a positive outlook on active slash public transition since 2010? Yes, I do. And I think it's somewhat of the next generation. And I, I'm not going to quote this at all, but I, I know that Dr. Steve Polzine used to work at Cutter, and he had worked on a, a, a research paper about the next generation on how they would rather have their cell phones rather than a car. Mm -hmm. And we might see a, a shift in that, that direction. It has nothing to do with um, getting places. It's more about the mentality of of their transportation and their, their living situation. So they would rather have a cell phone in the car. So I'm thinking they're gonna pay less for their transportation options rather than own a car, car insurance, gas. They would, they would take the, the cheaper option so they can pay that expensive cell phone. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So uh, another question actually relates to, to e-bike you just mentioned. Uh, it says studies have shown e-bike users experience improved health. Do you agree? I agree. I agree because they're outside the car, they're outside in their community, they're being social. Maybe not all of them, but it gives them an opportunity for that uh, to be social and, and in their community and, and walk more places because e-bikes can't go everywhere. So they have to stop and park and go somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's that's my argument there. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's another question. Um, um, it asked about, you know, um, in recent years, there have been re reports on e-bike batteries exploding and catching fire. Mm -hmm. Should we be prepared for these situations? Yeah, I think the e-bikes, the e-scooters, took this country by storm and around the world too. And I don't think we could have prepared quick enough for those those possibilities of batteries exploding and fires. I mean, we heard stories about it, but it, everybody wanted to try the e-scooter. Everybody w wanted a shared program. Everybody wanted their own personal e-scooter. So now I think we're re you know taking a few steps back on working on policies, not only for organizations on bringing e-scooters in a building or not. Mm -hmm. I think we're rethinking of what, the way we can do it and it will take time. Um, sometimes it's with the technology too. So we're kind of evolving uh, organizationally with the technology. Yeah, I think we have observed the increase of the person that owned the e-scooters on campus. And I, th I think the university should enforce some safety regulations, not let them go into the building. For safety reason. Mm, okay. Um, okay, so Richard mentioned we have a diagonal trail crossing in St. Pete, St. Petersburg, but the perpendicular pad crossing are not set to cross at the same time. Okay. That's not a question, I guess, information sharing. Good information. Yeah. All right, any other questions from in-house? So yeah. All of these people in here, I think, are students. So how can students at USF get more involved in active transportation on campus? Are there clubs? Yes. Yes, there are. So there's a bicycle club at, on campus, USF Bicycle Club, um, currently an advisor, as was mentioned before. And this club is different. This club, they, they get together, they socialize, they, they go on a ton of rides, recreation rides. They go on rides around campus. That's one way. Um, get in touch with your student government. I think student government's very interested in hearing about uh, multimodal, not only on campus, but off campus. You know, they, they want to promote safety. They want to be a part of it. Um, and, they, and I think this campus is changing. This campus is growing. This campus is a, a mini city. 
and we are part of the consolidation of University of South Florida St. Pete too. So we're all one big campus and we all have to talk. What are we doing? What can we change? We're very different than a lot of universities, but we are a growing university. So uh, be in touch with student government and check out the bike club. Hey, Mr. Okay, Jackman. Richard online has a question. Richard, go ahead. Can, can you hear me, Mr. Jackman? I can hear you through the computer. Oh, okay, I'll speak up. Um, I was wondering, since you work with uh, FDOT quite often, been around the state, a um, couple things have come up on the, especially on the trails, but on sidewalks, speed limits for bicycles, um, 20 miles an hour. Um, is there any discussion, especially with the weight of electric bikes and the uh, self-owned uh, e-scooters about reducing that speed limit on sidewalks? That, yeah, so that's a, that's a really hot topic. Um, I don't know what the cities or counties are planning right now or the states are planning for that. I definitely think something uh, something needs to happen to reduce those speeds or keep them somewhat separate or some lane markings because uh, you have very fast vehicles, electric vehicles intermingling with pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, so something needs to happen. Again, we get into that stage of, you know, the evolving electric vehicle is going a lot quicker than we anticipated. So we're catching up with those policies. So great question. I think that's a hot topic. Yeah, I'm just concerned because so many of the electric bikes, bikes are hybrid, pedal assisted or unassisted completely. And and they weigh so much. So that that's a big concern of mine here in Pinellas. It, 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 it could be um, in the future, what I see happening, what I see happening in the future, it could be an enforcement um, issue. Um, we've done a lot with, again, just ideas here, but a lot of speed cameras, I mean, um, enforcement, um, there's a lot of things that can happen. I know, I know changes uh, happen with pilot projects, see what works out, what doesn't work out. So a lot of research is needed in this field. Um, but great question, and I understand definitely where you're coming from, especially over in the uh, Pinellas County side. Oh, I just want to mention, uh, we may not have seen it in the city of Tampa, but in the big cities like New York, they are using the uh, electricity to cycle to deliver the cargo, deliver the parcels. And recently there was a news, they reduced the 20 mile per hour speed limit to 15 for the safety reason in okay. New York. Yeah, it's yeah. it's taking those... those um policies and other cities are learning from each other. Again, it doesn't have to be local. We can learn from each other, see what other cities are doing and try it out, but it's worth a try. I had a qu one more question in the back. Uh, so riding a bike on campus is pretty pleasant, uh, but I, I don't own a car. I ride a bike as my main mode of transportation nice. and riding in the area around campus is a mixed bag. Well, they've got those new protected bike lanes on like Bruce B. Downs. Uh, there's other places like 131st. Uh, that bike lane uh, or what passes for a bike lane is often overgrown, filled with debris. Um, the sidewalks aren't much better. Um, I see a lot of people like besides myself on a bicycle, I see people using like electric wheelchairs uh, driving down the street because the sidewalk's not, not safe for them. Um, are there ways that we can um, encourage more infrastructure uh, updates and uh, especially like bike friendly um, uh, yeah. updates, more like bike racks, like uh, better bike lanes, things like that. Sometimes, you know, and I worked on a, a project called the Tampa Bay Citizens Academy on Transportation. And the idea of that was to empower citizens to help make these decisions, but also really talk to their local city, county, state road, whoever manages that road to say, hey, some issues here as a citizen. I'd like to talk to you about it, see what we can do to make these changes. And it, it's just that, it's being a voice and you do have that voice. It's getting out there and, and making those connections. So let me know and, and I can connect you to the right people. Yeah, and also there are always the public meetings from like a Temple Terrace City, City of Tampa, Kisbrook yeah. County and POTPO. As a citizen, you are free to go and you know express your own opinion. And and yes, I'm part of the, uh, Hillsborough BPAC, Bicycle 
pedestrian advisory committee and we always have these discussions and what can we do to fix them so you, you sound like you be a good fit for you to <laughs> stop by <laughs> yeah jason all right so due to the time we have to stop okay. here uh, i just want to share another information is Jason and I actually will co-teach a course in fourth semester, sustainable transportation. So Jason definitely will focus a lot on what he has talked to here, and I will focus on transportation electrification, including electric uh, vertical takeoff landing vehicles for advanced air mobility. So for the students, you know, you may consider taking the course, and we can work together on some interesting projects. Yeah. All right. So. Thank you. With all this, let's thank Jason again for his uh, wonderful presentation. So much. Okay, I'll see everybody next Friday. Next, oh, next Friday actually I have maybe not on campus, but you will have a, uh, a seminar. So hopefully everybody will be here again. Okay, either in person or online. All right, thank you.